Hello, Hello. everyone. Welcome. We're gonna just wait a few minutes uh, no. to let people get in. In the meantime, if you want just to let us know where do you come from in the chat box, it would be great. Hey. Okay. So yeah, so it's seven. So I think we, we can start. We, we have a lot to, to go through. So um, so hi, everyone. Um, this is Milan here. Uh, I'm here with uh, Danielle Elsener and uh, Holly McFarlane. And uh, yeah, tonight we are um, happy to host this, this uh, second community call uh, for the Zero Waste Design Online Collective. Um, and we, for this second edition, we wanted to focus on um, design and making processes. So just uh, before going um, into the, the presentation, uh, we just want to let you know that this community call is recorded uh, and it will be made available on our website afterwards and probably on YouTube as well. So um, if you don't want to appear on this uh, record, you can just um, uh, turn, off, turn off the, the video. And also for the people, we're going to have uh, some presentation. Um, we can also edit the video afterwards if you don't want to, um, to show it on YouTube or on the website. So just um, for the people uh, who don't know yet uh, what is the collective. Uh, I think most of you knows already, but uh, our intention um, with um, this collective is to fill the lack of uh, educational resources about zero waste design methods and processes. Uh, we also want to put all our collective knowledge in one place um, and connect with each other. Um, and we want to transform the industry through open dialogue um, around garment construction, pattern cutting, design methods, and other innovative uh, use of technology. So our plan uh, is to, um, to organize some e-learning courses, online workshop, to set forum, and uh, to allow people to network. And we also want to provide um, open source patterns. So of course, this is just the beginning, so it's not set up uh, for the moment, but uh, it's all planned. Mm -hmm. So uh, for today, um, this is the outline. So first, uh, we're gonna have a presentation. Um, we wanted to, to make it like a, a picture, kucha style. So it's five minutes or so per, like each person. So we're gonna try to, to fit in one hour, uh, but it might go over one hour. Um, so we'll see how it goes. So first we have Daniel, then we have Holly. Um, we have also Anouk van de Vige. Oh, I'm sorry uh, if my pronunciation is not good. <laughs> it's a French pronunciation. <laughs> then we have Lakshmi, Pablo, Lisbeth, and um, me uh, at the end. So, Daniel. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today is um, I'm sure some of you may know that I recently won a grant, uh, the Evian Activate Movement grant, um, which is basically to give funding to sustainable projects um, that can make the most difference to the most amount of people. Um, I want to talk about very briefly the project that I submitted. Um, and what I'm going to be doing with the grant. So it's more of the process of uh, process of uh, writing an application. <laughs> uh, so you can hit the next one. Um, my uh, project is called AO to Zero, which is apparel um, zero to zero. Um, and it has like four different parts to it, four different aspects, which all lead into this one system. Uh, the first part is the tool. 
Um, if you came to our last workshop, our first workshop, um, we went briefly over one of my pattern master tools. Basically, I'm taking all of my work around zero waste pattern making and condensing it into these really easy to understand tools that anyone can use um, and that will soon be all made available online um, or in person. Uh, but basically, it's about spreading the information and make it e making it easier for people to access zero waste patterns. Um, the next slide, um, workshops. Um, I obviously did one with you guys like a week ago, uh, but I also host other ones where I go a little bit more deeper into the thinking uh, behind how I actually arrive at the patterns and helping um, to reframe how people think about design in general, um, breaking things down really into the granular and like um, understanding how and why we're creating uh, what actually is necessary when creating a pattern, what you can push, what you can pull that kind of thing. Uh, the next slide, um, this is all going to funnel into this idea for a micro zero waste factory. I worked with one of my friends who's an architect to create a net zero shipping container factory, which can be modular to be as large or as small as you need it, depending on uh, where it's going to be and what it's going to be used for. But basically everything you need in order to make uh, zero waste garments, including the tools and machinery will all be in this one space that can be picked up and put down anywhere in the world. Um, this has been slightly paused because of COVID, so uh, the plans are all there, it's ready, but it just didn't really make sense to make a physical space during this time. Um, but so the idea is that this would be a really open access area where anyone could come learn and play around, that kind of thing. Um, the next page shows this, I think this is the uh, slide that really uh, hit it on the head for them. This is an impact map of everything that I'm doing, what can make the most impact. Um, and so as you can see, it's these, um, you know, I work with um, brands, I have this factory idea, workshops, tools, but the thing that would make the most impact is actually making these tools that an individual person can use to um, change their thinking around design. So it's great if you want to like make your own clothing label, which I'm, you know, also doing, but the thing that will make the most impact is spreading of information. Um, so yeah, that's the very, very condensed version of um, my application. The written thing is very long, but these are the, uh, the few slides that went along with it. And I hope that made sense. And the next page is just a quote, I think. Yeah, I love puzzle solving, that's it. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think after each presentation, we had time for like one or two questions if you want, or we can just slide on to the next person. So if there's anything, feel free. If not, we'll just keep moving right along. No? Okay. Uh, I can ask you a question, Danielle. Do you think, uh, do, do you plan on, um, on making the shipping container um, at some point, like it's still in the, in the works, it's definitely something you want to do? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the shipping container is like the first stage of the factory I want to create. And the next stage is like actual full scale zero waste factory in like 10 years time, you know, mm -hmm. um, but the, the shipping container is definitely, um, definitely within the near future. Cool. Very if good. you want someone to set it up in France, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got any land for it? <laughs> oh, cool. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, it's me. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk to you about is um, some case studies for that I did for my PhD, um, like two years ago. Now I finished them, um, and so I went into my PhD thinking that I was going to um, explore the application of zero waste design methods uh, in the context of industry to see, you know, how it went and how successful it was, what problems were, that kind of thing. And, um, and so this slide here shows um, on the top line is the kind of a very simplified conventional uh, design and development and sampling and production process. And the idea was that you would replace the conventional design and development stage with, the, with a zero waste design and development stage. And so that's kind of what I thought would happen. Um, if, and, and so it would eliminate the waste through um, addressing waste as a design. Um, concern. So go to the next slide. Um, and so the first case study I did was with 
a very large fast fashion brand um, where I um, was invited to do a workshop with their um, marker makers. Um, and that, that kind of immediately raised alarm bells for me, but I, I did it anyway. And the reason it was, um, I saw it as potentially problematic was it, it kind of indicated to me that they didn't think of waste as a design problem. They thought that they see it as a production issue that is addressed through optimization um, at the end of the process. So where the big X is at the end there, um, they figured that they'd be able to eliminate waste. Um, by just basically making a better marker. But the thing is most um, uh, marker software is really, really good at optimizing um, that stuff anyway. Um, but regardless, we still managed to reduce the amount of waste. Um, the, the example you can see at the top um, on the left is a, um, a really simple dress, an existing design that they provided me and that's the marker that that one has. And you can see it makes quite a lot of waste. Um, and the goal was to reduce the yield and thereby reduce the waste. And so my very initial quick sketch of what could what it could do reduced it by about 10%. Um, so that blue bar you see at the end of the, um, the image on the top uh, right is the reduction in yield um, and, and the basic form of the pattern um, of the garment rather is unchanged, but the pattern shapes that make it are quite different. Um, go to the next slide. And then the next stage of um, the, um, the, the project was with a, a large sustainable brand and, um, and they wanted me to redesign an existing um, uh, iconic piece that they had. And, um, and so the pattern for that one, you can see um, in the, the pink and the um, the tan and the green and the blue marker um, on the top. And, um, and so you can see its um, yield is only 79.67%. Uh, and they wanted me to um, improve that, uh, ideally make it zero waste. And so it was a bit of a test just to see what would happen. But what kind of came out of it is that they didn't want to uh, kind of go through with the design that I proposed, which is the um, digital sketch on the uh, left and the um, corresponding pattern um, kind of in the middle there um, because the sleeve was too weird. <laughs> the sleeve seam spirals around the arm. It's like the spiral trouser if you came to the workshop uh, the other week. It's the same kind of concept but on a sleeve and that was too too strange. So they imagined that they'd be able to eliminate waste um, without changing the design at all. Um, so I had to kind of disabuse them of that notion. And if you go to the next slide. So what I thought um, needed to happen was that there needed to be a rethink of um, how a zero waste or low waste design development process fit into the over, overall um, kind of system. And that it needed to overlap more with more parts um, rather than being like a drop-in design solution that needed to be more, a little bit more holistic. Um, and so this was the proposed um, model which overlaps with factory sampling with the head designer with um, like kind of brand goals and aesthetics and that kind of thing, but it's still separate in terms of production. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. And so this one was with the same brand as the previous example. Um, in this case, they, they um, wanted me to redesign a slightly different uh, outcome, a men's version and a women's version. and. Um, and they provided me with the patterns. And so you can see in the top left, I'm taking their existing patterns and reworking them, trying to kind of find the negative space and see what I could do differently. Um, they had limitations, like they wanted the same aesthetic as the original, a full size range, no mixed marker. So that's no mixing of sizes on a single marker. Um, the construction and the fit um, had to remain the same across all sizes and aim for about 90% efficiency um, as opposed to the 80, 82, 83% efficiency that their uh, current one had. No shoulder seam because you wear a pack with this kind of thing and they didn't want it to rub on the shoulder and they wanted angled seam lines if possible. So you can see my design process. So again, um, they told me that I could uh, explore the spiral seam on this one because this design was a little bit more adventurous. And so I did, and um, and so I um, was developing um, the sleeve. So the this kind of 
triangular piece in the middle um, section in the blue is um, the sleeve. And you can see the marker um, for the first iteration of that on the side, um, on the right hand side. You go to the next slide. Yep. And at that point, we went to the factory. So I was like, I need to work with people who are producing this stuff to see if um, there's more that we can do. And so this is a photograph of the factory itself um, in Colombia. And, um, and I worked with the, um, with the factory floor manager and with the market maker and um, with everybody involved in the production of these garments to make sure it was possible to do. And then um, here is the, um, the finished design. Um, and as we went through the process, more and more limitations were added. So as well as the original ones, um, they also wanted a kangaroo pocket, no four-way seams, no grain line movement, um, feminine seam lines for the women's version, masculine ones for the men, so I couldn't use the same pattern kind of layout. Um, it wasn't allowed to change the hood, and the fit had to be identical to the original. And the basic kind of approach was to break it into large, medium, and small pattern pieces that themselves made rectangular sections. So um, so kind of designing a bunch of mini markers in the context of a large one. You can go to the next slide. And this is just a comparison between the different um, versions of the pattern. So the first one on the left is the original, 17% base. The blue one is um, the first iteration, which was an 18% reduction in yield and 10% uh, waste, so 7% reduction in waste which is nearly actually half, almost half the amount of waste is produced for that one. Um, and then uh, after we worked at the factory, there was design changes made. And so we had to alter the, the layout significantly um, and ended up with a similar yield, but slightly less waste. And then the final marker was um, ended up being um, back to what it was because the, um, the design process was disrupted by the head designer designing that, deciding that she wanted to kind of make changes that had no kind of thought to how much waste was produced. Go to the next one. And so the original design was a 22% reduction in waste and then the finished version that they produced and that you can buy in store was only a 2.2% reduction in waste. And it was because the head designer, the kind of tall gray box in the linear model, um, she uh, kind of overrode, uh, overrode all the decisions that were made in the design process. Um, and so we ended up making about as much waste as the original. So if you go to the next slide, what it made me realize is that we need to think holistically about zero waste. It's not just a design tool that you drop in and fix a problem. Um, it has to be a holistic systems approach and you have to deal with lots and lots of different people um, right across the board in terms of uh, marketing, production, uh, CEO, um, uh, financial um, stuff, everything. Um, otherwise it's um, not viable. And we also have to change the way we think about design as leading everything. Um, we need to realize that we're part of a larger system. Do you go to the next one? So these models here, the idea is that um, kind of limitations and things to do with production, the environment, social norms, that kind of thing, they kind of cascade inwards to the design process rather than starting with the design of a product and then problem solving your way out. Um, everything comes in towards you. That's it, I think. Yeah, that's just a quote. Here's my favorite quote. Designers are increasingly being called upon to contribute their particular knowledge and experience to the hornet's nest of contemporary crisis exacerbated by the habitual default to obsolete systems. That's my favorite quote. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have any questions? Can I ask a question? Sure. What would you do differently if you had to do it today? In the, the exact same project, like this last one? That Yeah, I would do it completely differently. Um, and that's been the, the good thing about doing the project is how much I learned from doing it. Um, I would start completely differently. Um, I wouldn't start with design at all. I would start with having a conversation about motivations and um, teams and, um, mm -hmm. you know, get everybody involved, get the head designer <laughs> involved. <but laughs> she couldn't derail Take me. Take down right the down. big square, rec the big rectangle. <laughs> yeah. Um, and have a really clear framework right from the, from the start. Um, 
yeah and and just the fact that I all the things that I know now what I needed to know then um I can do it again and it will be completely different um yeah everything awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah have they been like critical to their own process like because at the end it was not um they haven't said that to me but maybe they may have been internally but they they haven't expressed that to me um individual people who work there that i worked closely with um they were but um not not higher up in the hierarchy mm. um, it was yeah a lack of reflection i think is um is, is something that's quite common in the fashion industry and and then have you heard they have made some change in changes or other trials afterwards. yeah 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 they have um they took um like a lot of the things that we realized um in the process like um, they needed to analyze all of their product line and work out um where the easy wins were first rather than just kind of randomly selecting something to work on um and so they've kind of looked at their largest selling um items and the things that are um like really uh have a high yield and a high waste um already kind of put them in a hierarchy and then they're tackling to things down through that way so um so yeah i know they have um applied a lot of what we worked on just uh, in a slightly different context hmm. okay um then we can move on to anouk um just to contextualize um Last week, we have hosted um, a workshop in which Holly explained how to make spiral trousers. And then um, Hanuk uh, has, um, has tried to make her own spiral trousers. So she has sent us a video about her making process. Uh, so we're going to share it with you. Oh, it's lagging. That's it. So Hanuk, if you are here, um, I think you had a question about the spiral trousers. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Yes, I have some questions because when I make them in small, like the little ones, they look perfect. And then when I try to measure and to make them in my own size, at the end, they were too wide at my hips and also in my tie and too sh the legs were too short. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm normally not very good in measuring and <laughs> that kind of thing, but I was trying and trying. I tried it three, eight times again. And at the end, I didn't know what did I do wrong, or did I do some wrong with did I did did I do something wrong with numbers or any I don't know, but in small they look perfect, and I was like, oh yes, they're going to look perfectly. <laughs> then at the end, when I was trying to when I was making the big ones, like oof, something's going wrong. So <laughs> yeah, there's a few things um, that you might want to kind of bear in mind. So if it's too wide around your hip, then what that means is that the width of the um the, the widest part of the triangle um if you measure down from the waistline to where your hip would be i, I have here the one you the one you sent for the workshop yeah, yeah. so this part, you, the wide yeah across part. there or where the hip would be um that needs to be half your hip half my hip so so if you measure around your widest point around your hip and then you go um add a bit of ease you know add a bit, bit of room so they're not like crazy tight unless you want them really tight mm -hmm. um then that that width that that part of the triangle needs to be um half your hip oh. and um and then if um it means that the like it's kind of like a cone right like an upside like a ice cream cone and the yeah. widest point is actually at your waist for this pattern so you have to take in some darts or gather it or something to make it go in to your waist but that hip measurement needs to fit you the way that you want it to fit so probably your triangle needs to be narrower and a bit longer yes um, and then you'll be able to it'll spiral more times around the leg which will make it longer 
So that's what I would suggest you do. Um, if you find the leg is too wide and the hip is too wide, you just need to make that top part narrower and then add a bit of length um, at the kind of pointy end of the triangle. Okay. So give that a go. Um, they they are they are kind of both very simple and very complex. Um, and it takes a bit of kind of trial and error to get your head around how it works um, and how you can change it to make it fit a particular uh, shape. And sometimes there are certain trouser silhouettes that you just can't achieve using that method. Um, except for the fact that you can, um, you know how it's like a 90 degree angle um, and so it's like a rectangle and you divide it in a diagonal. That 90 degree angle doesn't need to be 90 degrees. You can kind of open it up if you want. And but that will make some triangular shaped pieces that are waste that you have to use somewhere else. Um, and they can be used for, you can make waistbands out of them. You can make belt loops, um, any kind of finishings or, um, you know, that, that facings, that kind of thing, you can use that for that. So it's just a bit of trial and error, but once you get it, um, and once you get the right kind of proportions for your body, then it's very easy. And that's why I use Clo for these, because you really quickly just play around with the size of that triangle so that it fits you exactly how you want it to. And one last thing, when you sew it, you have to make sure that you um, aren't stretching the diagonal line because if you're sewing it and that diagonal line is line is being stretched out it's going to change the shape of the trouser it's going to get much much skinnier and narrower around your calf um, and so you have to kind of mark you know every 30 centimeters or something um, on the straight line and the diagonal line so that you match them up as you go because because it's on the bias it's so easy to stretch it out accidentally okay Okay. okay. Thank you very Hope much. That helps. And um, you know, I look forward to seeing an update of a beautiful pair of trousers. <laughs> yes, yes, it should be nice. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So next we have uh, Liz Haywood, uh, who is in Australia, and I think it's 4 a.m. at the moment. So <laughs> she is <laughs> she's decided to send us a, a video uh, to explain us um, a bit about her process. So here it is. Hello everyone, I'm Liz Haywood and I'm very pleased to be able to share with you my design process for how I make zero waste patterns. My background is that I trained as a pattern maker in 1990 and 91, but I started my career as a junior cutter in a swimwear factory and then for 20 years worked in the fashion industry as either a pattern maker or a cutter or both. And I worked mostly here in Australia uh, and for a short time in London. Ten years ago uh, we had a family and moved to the country and my career moved sideways. So I now teach sewing and write and make patterns. And I'm the author of Dressmaker's Companion, a, a sewing reference. Uh, it's a no frills encyclopedia type book. And as we all know, understanding garment construction is the key to making usable patterns that work. And I'm also the author of Zero Waste Sewing, which came out earlier this year. Unfortunately, in the same week that we locked down, you just can't predict these things six months ahead. Uh, so Zero Waste Sewing is a collection of 16 um, Zero Waste Sewing patterns um, based around three cutting themes. A top from square, the famous bog coat and tessellated patterns and there are ideas in there for getting started with your own zero waste patterns. Uh, so I now write PDF zero waste patterns. Uh, I prefer this to, uh, I prefer this format to a book because I'm not restricted to page numbers and I feel like I, I can put more in them. I uh, originally read about zero waste patterns from Holly and Timo's book and I immediately clicked with it because I was already a pattern maker and I already had a lot of ex if years experience um, making markers uh, and as we know the two go together. So how do I go about making a zero waste pattern? Um, I don't I don't use a computer at all to draft patterns partly because I don't know how um, but mostly because I don't enjoy sitting in front of a screen as much as I like doing and making with paper and fabric. 
I'm very much a flat pattern maker. I, I don't really do draping all that much. So I have a sketchbook where I write down ideas and the ideas come in the form of a cutting layout. So sometimes uh, it's a mini challenge. Uh, for example, could I make a top from a, a perfect square of fabric? So there's a, a, a challenge inside the zero waste challenge. Uh, and sometimes I see um, people wearing clothes or people wearing clothes in magazines or in books and I think, hmm, maybe I could try that in zero waste. So here's an example from my sketchbook. So this is an Armani dress, oops, uh, which I thought, hmm, I think that could be zero waste. And that's, so at, when I stuck it in my sketchbook, that's the, that's the little idea I had. So the yoke is the, um, the armholes. So when I have an idea, I go from the idea straight to fabric. And I don't use calico. I try and use a wearable fabric so that it can be finished off and worn by someone. But I don't use fabric that's too special, just in case I get it all wrong. I use a Winifred Aldrich ordinary block, like you do when you learn pattern making. I use one of these just to give me a guide for size as I go. And then uh, when I have cut it out in fabric, I pin it together and try it on all pinned together. I use pins without heads because they're not so sharp. That's what I do for most of my patterns. Occasionally, I use a Barbie doll because we've got them in the house uh, and just try something out with Barbie. I like Soccer Barbie the best because she's posable. I cut out garments in my size so that I can try them on and I keep very detailed notes as I'm cutting and sewing. And it takes me about a day to invent, cut and sew a garment, and then it takes about another four to six weeks to write sewing instructions and illustrate and that sort of thing. Size inclusivity is important to me. And the number one question that people ask me about zero waste sewing is large ladies ask me, is there anything I can make from this book? And the answer is yes, you can make almost everything from this book. So I, with PDF patterns, I strive for 12 or more sizes. And if I can't do it in 12 sizes, then I won't do it. When I've got the first garment sorted, I make it in bigger sizes and then I fit test on friends who are appropriately sized. And sometimes uh, the fit test garments become the ones we end up photographing. It is really hard to do zero waste in lots of sizes and most often what I do is just turn the fabric around so I'm cutting across the fabric. An example is this blouse which I have just done, which has a very simple cutting layout like this. So see how the selvage is at the top and the bottom and I'm cutting across and so uh, as it gets bigger it'll just take up more fabric. But I have produced this top with a simple dirndl skirt, which as we know is just a rectangle gathered into a waistband. And that means I can actually cut this around the other way. So I'll put it this way. So the selvage is at the top and bottom again. And see I've got the top and then these skirt panels soak up all the extra fabric, which gives you a lot more flexibility with the kind of fabrics you use, because you can use one way prints and things with naps, and you can cut the skirt and the top all together, all in the same direction. This is a zero waste hoodie top, which I didn't cut around the other way. I cut it the regular way, how we usually cut clothes. So here's the layout. So, so the selvage is here and at the top. And so the front and back are here and the width of the fabric is, is like the wingspan, the, the sleeve to sleeve of the top. So you can see uh, all the details go along the sides and as the top gets wider we get less and less fabric for the details so I just kept adding fabric on the end to use for that. Uh, it was really really hard and I nearly gave up because there were 12 sizes and practically every size had a, a, a different tweak on the layout. Some people have asked what I do with the neck cut out when I make zero waste patterns. I almost always use it as a back neck facing, but in this puff sleeve, I've cut it in half and used it to 
beef out the gathers in the sleeve a bit more. This is what the sleeve looks like. Like this. Uh, just a couple more things about construction. I use a 12 millimeter bias binding quite a lot for finishing the necks and I finish it as a facing uh, because I don't need any extra fabric for it and it makes a very neat finish. So there's a, a photographic tutorial for how to do this on my website lizhaywood.com.au in the January 2020 archive. Thanks for watching. Liz is here, I think. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, I am here, but I'm sorry my computer has no camera. That's okay. <laughs> or I'm sitting here with the light out in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone have any questions? No questions. <laughs> yeah. Over how long did it take you to develop the zero waste book? like from the concept to like when it was published during quarantine? Um, 15 months. 15 months. Awesome. But the, the actual projects, I did about, I think I did about 22 projects to start with before I, edit, uh, like I cut out the ones that I didn't think I wanted in there. And it took about 12 weeks to develop the projects and then the rest of the time was making the book and making samples and things like that and photographing and all the other things that you do. Um, Amazing. But the, the time taken to um, actually um, get an idea was really quick, but it's all the mopping up afterwards that takes ages. Absolutely. Can't believe you're awake for this call right now. So impressive. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask something as well? Of course. Yes. Um, really, really, really compliments. And it's so awesome with all the various sizes. I'm impressed. Um, I would really like to ask then, do you use simple woven fabric for everything? Or because I mean, if you use knit, for instance, maybe sometimes you will have difficulties because the knit won't stay completely straight. They um, don't act all the same way or do you have preferences for your fabric? I, I do have preferences for my fabric. I find it hard to get knits here. I live in the country in Australia and there's hardly anywhere to buy fabric. So I mm. tend to and there's, but there's a quilting shop is the closest shop to me. So I tend to use fabric that's easy to get, like 110 centimetre wide quilting cotton type fabrics. And I find oh. knit, in Australia, knits come in all different widths and I can't, it's harder to predict what might be available to people. So I aim for the easiest to get type fabric. And I don't actually wear a lot of knits myself so maybe that influences that too. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for asking. And so Liz, uh, where, where can we buy your, your book? Is it available online or? Yes, just uh, wherever you buy books. So you could buy it from the book depository or Amazon, or you could order it from your local bookshop and support independent local bookshops. Yeah. And mo most bookshops have an online thing now, so you could order it from there. But it's uh, available normally where you would buy books. Okay, great. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Lakshmi uh, from San Jose, California. Uh, I am a student of West Valley College. Uh, I saw a few videos where Holly came and uh, gave a workshop in uh, West Valley College. At that time, I was not a student there. <laughs> uh, so uh, I did my first zero waste collection as part of my graduation. Uh, so I actually had an industry experience. I worked in factories back in India. So I know how much of you know, fabric is wasted and, you know, it's like, it's very, 
it's not pleasing to eyes to see that fabric cuts um, and then also uh, I grew up in a place where there are all like artisans and weavers and they do hand looms and beautiful textiles which I don't feel like you know just cutting and throwing away so uh, I remember my mom used to uh, uh, make dresses out of her saris beautiful dresses and at that time I used to I was a child but then I used to just play with fabrics and turn and twist and then uh, I remember at 13 I think I designed a poof skirt <laughs> you know so I, I think that's there in me like to uh, uh, you know play with fabrics like unlike the traditional flat pattern uh, making so I think that is uh, that is what inspires me to create uh, uh, different silhouettes not like the regular ones uh, uh, unconventional so uh, uh, during my uh, uh, fashion co design course my professor showed Holly's book in the class and I took from her I just go, you know saw that book and I was very much inspired this is where I have to go uh, and then also I have a very uh, 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 what you say I, I love these artisanal fabrics and I actually wanted to do something with artisanal fabrics and when I saw like all these designs and I thought I should maybe club this both because you know you can address people on the planet right so uh, that's how i uh, started my first uh, collection so the this pattern is the uh, example of the you know the first slide so i i just use the i can actually show like can we have like side by side so that i can yeah maybe i i can just go back to the picture and then i can yeah so this is all like all rectangles so uh the the body is a <clears throat> is a straight rectangle i didn't have a shoulder seam i just folded the fabric and then gave a neckline in the center and then parallel to that whatever fabric is left i i actually changed the grain <clears throat> and then i used it as a skirt and the excess fabric I manipulated into pockets uh, like you can see here uh, on the sides uh, yeah I can't show my mouse so yeah yeah those are the pockets and then just to add the aesthetic I actually used another uh, by the way these are all like hand uh, hand drawn using natural dyes the entire fabric is hand drawn it's not dyed so that uh, there's no like dyeing effluent and all it's just drawn with the hand and then the the uh, the, the solid fabric is like again a natural dyed uh, fabric and then so I have used sleeves by cutting the fabric you can go back to the pattern yeah so uh, the the light colored one uh, is the the floral one and the dark color one is the is the fabric that i used for sleeves so if you if you see the sleeves uh, i have used like an l shape for the sleeves and the remaining fabric <coughs> in the pattern why oh, should i have actually push side by side yeah so this one i used for the hem uh, like there is a short piece of fabric these there are two short pieces of fabrics and broader ones so broader ones I gathered up and I gave like a silhouette attached to the shorter piece and then the <clears throat> the fabric that I used uh, uh, that is left out out of cutting the neck I have turned into flaps and I used for the hand and the hemline and the fabric that is left after the sleeves I've used for the hem parts I mean the 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 contrast color part and the and some of it I used for the facing of the neckline in so uh, this was my first experiment and I was really glad that I could achieve like without wasting the fabric and then you can go to the other slides so uh, I believe in 
creating design elements even though it, I, I don't I don't think if it is zero waste we can't achieve like design elements so I just uh, add added like the in the shoulder this is a different top uh, in the center one I have added a triangular a square piece folded in triangular and then I have given like a design element uh, and then I love slot sleeves uh, when you don't have much seam elements I use the uh, fab uh, the rectangular pieces and I use slot seams and then uh, these are like different design elements you can go to the next slide and this is my the my collection uh, that I made the entire collection is made out of zero waste and the and the trousers that the this guy is wearing is like something like the spiral trousers like the, uh, Holly had shown uh, it's actually uh, done uh, it's 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 the the fabric is first stitched in certain way and then the pattern is taken so that way it's more easy and then you don't I mean uh, it's it it won't be more fussy when you're cutting like different styles basically it's a biased uh, uh, trousers and then I think like uh, that's what uh, uh, someone was asking that when you have like a wide uh, hip and waist area this is how it looks and then I manipulated that into large cowl pockets and then uh, the excess I folded into pockets and I did like made made like a cowl uh, style with a broader crotch area just like a style <laughs> feature so yeah I basically want to do sustainable designing so I so at fabric level I want to use the artisanal fabrics uh, and then I basically work with ovens uh, oven fabric and then uh, hand looms um, hand loom fabric and then so for the production techniques I would like to explore more on zero waste so that I can uh, I can just produce uh, with this combination of artisanal textiles and zero waste so yeah I'm still a budding <laughs> designer I can say yeah but I definitely want to learn about uh, 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 more from Holly and Daniel and uh, Awesome to uh, meet you guys. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, about the natural dyes. I've experienced experimented with natural dyes before, but I couldn't get them to fix on the fabric. Basically, my work was on display on a gra in a glass corridor and when I got it back it was ruined and all faded and I was just wondering what sort of fixative that you use uh, yeah that is actually a, a drawback <laughs> I know natural uh, dyes do have that thing but I think you could uh, try mordanting with uh, alum which is a natural mineral and then I think there are uh, moderns that are available after uh, the dyeing process is done like an after treatment uh, yeah so uh, but it I think it depends from area like you know I get uh, all these from India so there is a different uh, version of the moderns there so so I think it depends on the place where you live right and the temperature yeah, yeah. yes <laughs> all right thank you yeah. I had a, um, a student, a master's student, who was using natural dyes um, as a like printing with natural dyes, and um, and initially she was trying to avoid the fact that they faded, and then it actually became a key part of her research. So she developed um, garments which were designed to be partially deconstructed so that you could reprint, and so that means that you can refresh the aesthetic and the print. Yeah. Um, and take advantage of the fact that the the, the dyes fade, um, and you know everybody always wants a new season print or a, a different aesthetic, and and you know why not use you know the, this kind of natural behavior of natural dyes um, yeah. to your advantage? So it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. 
<laughs> yeah, I think yeah, we love we all love faded jeans, but not <laughs> faded natural dye. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, thank you once again. Yeah, I guess it's my turn. Um, can I share? Uh, oh, okay. Let's go with this. Um, hi, my name is Pablo, and um, I'm here to present my collection thesis, bachelor thesis work that I did in 2016, um, where my aim was to create a three-piece, zero-waste men's suit collection. But I only ended up with one, <laughs> one pattern because one pattern took actually six months to, or, or maybe like four months to create, plus the, the process of making the suits. And um, I originally like, I have studied tailoring before this, before, before entering fashion design school. And um, I kind of like took the concept of a bespoke suit, which is made to measure for the man. Um, but of course I didn't have like a customer, but I just, just used the measurements, but the technique of cutting it in a unique way and then producing it into a final garment. And um, yeah, you can see the result on the left and then the pattern is there um, on the middle. And um, let's see. Yeah, uh, only the shell material is used. And uh, le yeah, let's go back to the whole idea became uh, because men are actually um, quite critical on what they want to wear, <laughs> or at least very traditional men. They're very picky. So, and, and also the tailoring community is very, very traditional. Of course, they have had this like 2000 year tradition of developing <laughs> their own technique on how to produce garments, but also they aim for the perfection of the fit and to make the man look very good. So basically experimenting and, and doing like tryouts on different techniques, it's not really what they're, what they focus and or, or really want to consider even. But yeah, um, so I was taught uh, the traditional tailoring ways, but I didn't really, <laughs> apparently I wasn't traditional enough because I really wanted to try this out. So initially my goal became that, hey, um, let's see if I can create form, a very uh, strict and defined form with the zero waste pattern. And usually the suit, men's suit use about two, no, 4.5 meters of fabric. And they really don't look into how much is wasted. Of course, the wool especially is very expensive and they try to save it as much as possible, but um, they sacrifice what they consider to be sacrificed in order to achieve the results. And um, well, basically my, I started from the traditional patterns of the men's suit, just like uh, Liz does, or Liz explained. Um, I'm also a very 2D designer. I don't do a lot of draping or anything like that because it's, it gets too difficult in my head. But um, yeah, I started uh, breaking up the traditional patterns. I look into the details, what makes a man's suit and what doesn't in a way, so that I could define the different details and possibly sacrifice something in the way or along the way. And I have to mention that I was also very prepared to fail or to end up with a result that actually wouldn't do or, or like would aim to look as much as a suit as possible, but not being a, completely a suit. And um, well, the final, final pattern is a little bit wider than the 150 centimeters that we normally have is uh, 161. Uh, times uh, 224.5 centimeters. And uh, it has, it consists 68 different p independent pieces. And the good part about the tailoring thing was especially combining three, three um, different garments that are usually 
made from the same fabric is that uh, a lot of the scraps are normal, even normally used to do all the trimmings and all the uh, details and pocket flaps and things like that. So basically I went in and tried to do the tr traditional bigger pieces at first and then just went along until I only had the little pieces and then it was just about like getting very, very creative on how to use everything. And what uh, helped me also is that like, of course, menswear have, have like a really long history about doing different details and, and getting very exquisite about stuff because men love that. And that's the part of a, an essential thing about also menswear is that all the details are very like small and defined. So uh, they're more like in the, in the like concept of the clothing instead of like shapes and things like that. So um, I looked through a lot of different material and history books and, and pattern making um, magazines. For example, the Runeschau magazine is very, very good because they have also like quite experimental pieces. And for example, the menswear, no, sorry, the trousers pattern came from that. It's like a twisted seam trousers pattern that you, you could actually make like from one piece the whole leg so in a way I kind of like had to get very creative with it and that was basically the first part of of um, making the pattern and the second stage of the thesis was actually uh, also taking in consideration that when the suits are made into patterns like visual patterns I'm sorry, the words are like very different, very same in English, so it's hard to explain. But yeah, if you use stripes or for example, uh, checks, um, in the tailoring tradition, the visual effects are matched. And that's like a goal and an example of how good the tailor is. You usually can't really tell if um, the details don't match, but when they don't match, you notice it easier than when they do match. So um, what I also did was I hand printed, because my inspiration was black on black, uh, hand printed uh, stripes and checks. And usually the stripes and checks uh, add about uh, half to one and a half meters of fabric use so that all the pieces are matched. So in the end, it resulted in a slim fit uh, three piece menswear suit. And, and to be honest, uh, I hadn't looked into this <laughs> work in a long time because I'm studying now um, digital services. But yeah, um, nowadays I'm, I'm also very impressed about how this, this turned out and, and that it was even possible. I'm like, wow, <laughs> how, how, how did I do this? Yeah. <laughs> But um, I had a great honor to be, uh, to write a, I had a great honor from the Zero Waste Collective, online collective to write a blog post. So um, it's on their website. So if you want to get deeper into the process, you can read all the details and uh, a lot of examples about the pattern um, interpretation and how they ended up from there. Thank you. Thank you. I have to admit when I first saw this work, I was astounded. Like <laughs> it's yeah. remarkable. And um, and every time I show, I I show it all the time in lectures when I talk about what's possible and I show people and they're just like, what? <laughs> How? Yeah, I know. So very well done. I'm so Thank impressed. You. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You wrote uh, this suit saves forty seven percent of fabric. Yes. Does that normally does that mean that normally you will have forty seven percent waste? Mm, yeah, in a way, I kind of like uh, counted this square like square centimeter areas and compare them to each other. So but basically when, it, uh, when they use normally the 4.5 meters of fabric and they place all the difference, then again, I think that it's about like 15 to 20% of, of per, uh, waste that comes out from the suit. Mm. Yeah, because you're- Oh, and it's dry to check, no, then it's even more. Yeah, 
That's if you thing. have striped or checked fabric, then it's even more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. With the okay. print, when you, when you did the stripes and the checks, uh, yeah. did you engineer it to the pattern or was it just an all over consistent check and stripe? Um, I engineered it. So yeah. in a way, like when you see the pieces uh, printed, it was actually never um, done in a way that you could like print the whole fabric, but it could be done. But uh, when you see the visual effect, then all the patterns go in different ways. And it's like a very hmm, trippy pattern in that way. Wow. And how many iteration, I mean, how many prototypes have you made before uh, <laughs> getting to this point? Um, our, uh, our school offered one course it was compulsory course on sustainability and zero waste design was part of it. And um, I've always been into sustainability. So somehow I just got the idea from that course. Um, there I just did like a very basic grading on menswear like uh, shorts and I mean, I think tights. So I just like let it sit in for um, the time that took, uh, like I went, um, I did a exchange program between and I didn't think about like so much about zero waste or I didn't do much of zero waste, but I just thought about it. I was just, I don't know, it was now what I'm thinking, I was like a bit too arrogant and bold to think that I could pull this off, but I did pull it off. So thank goodness to that. So yeah, uh, it was like, I don't know, I just jumped and, and uh, I used like all my knowledge that I have had about menswear and, and I also got a little bit help of uh, other professionals in name like namely considering the patterns and the fitting mm. because also tailoring like takes years to master and basically I just have the basic knowledge of it. But your question was did you make various sewing tests? uh of the suit well i yeah. went along the way and did like several different details at at the time and just um it was just trial and error like for four months until somehow it magically <laughs> turned out into a ready pattern when you realize that it had worked you know, after that four months of work, what was that? Was that like a relief or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't like, um, it was it was such a rush in a way, considering the graduation and I had, I had to write the, uh, our thesis and then we had our fashion show. So I just like, um, I think that um, when, from the picture, you can see the darker gray and the black or like the, the two darker grays, they're like the trouser and the jacket, which were the most important. And by that time that I got to the waistcoat, which in the in these three pieces, it's like the freest one of form. It has the most variations. And let's say that men are less picky about it. How does it look? So in a way it was just like filling it out and, and just testing how the waistcoat would look. And then suddenly I just realized like, hey, I might have like, everything here and and yeah it was it was it, it was a weird time <laughs> wow thank you are there any more questions great work yeah okay Please hi hello everyone i'm lisbeth um, I'm originally from Denmark, but I live in Italy. Uh, I was trained as a yeah, tailor, mainly making period costumes for more than 20 years. And I have my studio at home. I work freelance and make clothing and costumes and felting, more felting last couple of years and then um, this summer I bought Holly's book 
and I was just like, oh, yeah, you can make curved shapes as well, because my former knowledge was really limited to, you know, the classical historical uh, shirts made of rectangles, squares, <laughs> always using the width of the fabric. So this was really mind blowing to me. And I said, okay, I want to try this. I put up a little sketch. I just said um, a little drawing. I wanted to make a hoodie. And I would have one fixed pattern shape that would be the hood. Then I would have drop shoulders, um, pockets on the front. Um, and the rest was more or less free. So actually, this is the second version. If you go to the next picture, you can see the first, no, the next picture. This is the first version, a fabric I was gifted some time ago and I didn't like it at all, but um, it was just lying around. And then I have this friend who really loved it. So I had her in mind, I would make something to her. And um, it is, yeah jersey knit and the second picture from the left you can see the the pattern cut out and also the amount of waste i have and the whole amount of cutoffs is less than six percent but as you can see i only made one hoodie so i didn't have to think about larger production or whatever um, this, I, I just started out experimenting. I didn't have like a goal that I want to put this into production or I want to, I don't know where this will bring me. I would like to do some more, <laughs> really. I, I want to do much more, but this is the start. Um, this shirt. Uh, or hoodie has got some really weak points to me, like uh, this first version, it's got, um, I don't know, can you see my my mouse? No. If I go here? No, okay. Uh, the pockets are not functional because they are, they are a bit wide, but, but uh, low. And um, you can see the sleeve on the back side. I don't like the detail how it, it, um, yeah, the finish at the bottom. I don't like it at all. I think the you have a lacking thing with with the the. Um, I got this two piece sleeve where the 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 narrower piece goes down to the bottom, and it should be connected with the the um, darker line somehow. So what did I do? I uh, made a second version. I said, okay, I will go and have some small changes. I want to make the sleeve different at the bottom. I want to uh, take away just two centimeters of the width. Um, just to see what happens to the pattern when I do that. So if you go to the first picture again, the previous, this one, I bought this fabric that was knit um, with the brushed surface on the back side. I really like it, but ah! <laughs> because you can see the picture in the middle it was tearing, it was not, I, I, it was pulling. So I didn't, um, I couldn't really, um, I thought if I had like a big studio with an ironing board, I will probably tear the fabric and hold it up with pins to, to work it with damp to, to kind of try to fix it but I was too much in a hurry to do something about it. So um, I didn't do that. <laughs> I cut the, the pattern as it was. And um, 
I, this is really work in process because I got far too much waste. <laughs> oh. Sorry? <laughs> I got far too much waste, and um, as you can see, I made some um, decorative elements to use up the the, the voids, the empty spaces. So, for instance, the my change on the bottom of the sleeve, I made this. Um, half circle to cover the inseam just to reinforce it and to put a decorative element. Then I made the elbow patch. Then on the previous model, I had um, a reinforcement on the neck. I also have it here, but it's much smaller and I put it on the inside instead of the outside. Um, and also, if you go to the previous picture, also put one on the hood. You can see there's half a circle, just as a, exactly, just as a decorative element. Um, yeah, I learned so much from this process, mostly the difficulties in transferring uh, pattern to another piece of fabric when this fabric is, as in this case, it was uh, larger, but but um, not so high. So I had to re-put all my shapes down. And uh, I felt also that this is really the beginning of um, the adventure of um, thinking out of the box. It's really great exercise because, I mean, I have, yeah, actually, I have 28 years of experience in classical tailory um, for, yeah, classical tailory, but also period costumes. So really pattern making, I enjoy it so much. I really have fun with it. But to think it as a puzzle is a whole new approach. It's a whole new way of getting into the pattern. And I, I just think it's so amazing. And it's so, wow, <laughs> mind blowing. So I'm happy to be here with you. And I really hope to have, yeah, so many more occasions to to get together and to <laughs> hear what you guys are up to and, and hearing about different approaches, different ways of dealing with yeah, stuff and so on. So yeah, Thank if you, you got any questions, I'm here and <laughs> happy to share. Awesome, very creative, very creative. Yeah, I have to say, I'm um, sorry. Uh, do you want to go? No, no, you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have to say, like, I, I like, I love the language of the, the the hoodie that you like. This is your first piece, and like, it, it's it's um extremely sporty, and like, I love the lines about it. So, if mm. like, don't feel bad about like not having this in product or going into production, but like, if when as this is your first piece, I'm like, um foreseeing that you will have a very, very insightful career with zero waste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the same thing. It's, um, you know, uh, I, I remember when I started uh, doing zero waste, it never actually occurred to me to use rectangles. <laughs> I don't know why, but it didn't. And, um, and so I, I always, I started right from the beginning with all these curved lines and um, I just had so much fun with them and yeah. I just found I don't know so much more more freedom and when I go back to rectangles um, and sometimes I you know you have to because it's easy for parts of it or whatever but I yeah curves are, are where I'm at 
Um, but I wanted uh, to ask, did your um, your background in period costume, do you, did you use, how much of that came into this? Because there's a lot of examples in period costume that is uh, low waste or, or even zero waste. Did, did you draw on any of that knowledge? I think I always do. <laughs> I, I, I not not consciously, but I think I always do, actually. Um, I I can't really answer that question. I think yeah. I think it's it's an underlying stream. It's always there. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be the same. I'm sure with um, Pablo and tailoring, and it's like it's just the thing you understand and know. Yeah. You use it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And I wanted it to be zero waste, so actually, I immediately I took all the scraps and I used it as <laughs> padding in a, a little Christmas gift. You know the the what do you call them the um, the things you use in the kitchen to take hot stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so because I wanted, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because yeah, my amount of waste was fifteen point eight percent in the second version, and I was not concerned about that at all. But yeah, keep working on it. Okay. I'll, I'll keep playing. I got no idea where uh, this will bring me. I'm so happy to have met you guys because. Um, I live in the middle of the countryside. I haven't got any sort of contact here in the neighborhood or people interested in stuff like this. So, so this is really amazing to be able to connect. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing. So great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Milan. Yeah, next is me. So I'm the last one uh, and I'm gonna just explain uh, a project I have. Um, yeah, I have started uh, in the last lockdown because I'm still in lockdown, but this is the second, it was in the first one. <laughs> so my intention was um, to design a DIY zero waste dress, uh, which would be more feminine, like uh, because I, I tend to, well, I design a shape that I like, I, I would wear. And uh, I've had um, many critics like, yeah, it's cool to, to do the always design, but it's not that feminine and you don't have so much curves in what you do, blah, blah, blah. So I was, okay, I'm gonna try to do something different. <laughs> so I started from um, the circle skirt, which, which is quite uh, wasteful. And I wanted to, to come up with uh, something zero waste. So I wanted to make a dress. Um, so yeah, you can go to the next one. So this uh, was my first iteration. So what I did is um, I, I look at the, the waste um, I generated in the corners and I thought, Maybe I could uh, widen uh, those areas uh, in order to place uh, a body. Um, so mm -hmm. considering the fact that uh, we could have like a, a, a front, um, a, a right side um, and the same on the back. So four pieces. And um, yeah, I had it uh, some seams um, like I, yeah, I put um, seams in the middle and I thought, okay, for if I want to make a dress with um, uh, a zip uh, on the back, I should add a seam as well on the skirt. So this was my first iteration. But the thing is that I realized that the middle front that you can see on the right side was too long uh, to be a front, a uh, middle front. So I, I thought, okay, I need to do other iteration. So this is on the next slide. So uh, the second iteration, um, I added again some seams. So you can see the white areas um, on the side of the circle. And um, 
um, at that point, um, I realized that I had too much seams everywhere. Like uh, I had seams on the shoulder and I didn't want to have those seams on the shoulder because I already have seams on the front and it was too much. So I just changed the layout. Um, so I flipped and um, and yeah, I ended with a, a no shoulder seam uh, body version. I was more happy with this one. Um, so then next, uh, um, I thought, okay, so now I have, I have negative shapes. Um, so all the right areas. So I, at first I thought, okay, I have four uh, similar shapes. So maybe I can do some pockets um, like over, under, right pockets and over, under, uh, left pocket. Oh, it's written right and right, but it's right and left, obviously. Um, so that was uh, my intention, but um, in the DIY uh, document I have uh, written, I wanted to offer the possibilities uh, to do different um, uh, details. Like me, I really like wearing pockets on my garments because <laughs> I think it's useful. Uh, but obviously you can do other different var variation like uh, color cuffs or um, any um, front uh, details as well. And I did the same uh, then for uh, the circle uh, negative shapes, uh, which are on this next slide. So that was the same um, uh, thinking process. I looked at those shapes and and start thinking, hmm, what could I do with with them? Um, so I had two possibilities that I like most. Uh, those were cuffs, like. But like button tabs uh, on the cuffs um, because um, the the yeah the bottom of my sleeve was quite fitted, so I wanted to be able to open it with a, a tab, and I also um, thought maybe I could um, had a patch on the entrance of the pockets on the sides, so the pockets get visible kind of. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was also inspired by other shapes. So what I do basically is that I go on Pinterest and I just <laughs> go through all the shapes that I can, I can find and I then determine what would be the best for my style. And um, yeah, so that was um, how I exploded this. And then on the next slide, uh, yeah, yeah, there is a, the recording as well. So my process my design and making process uh, is is uh, always uh, through 3d uh, prototyping software um, i use them a lot um, to test um, all my iterations um, to test all those kind of uh, playing with the negative um, areas um, and um, for this specific example, I also played with the prints. So I had uh, like a, a square print and I uploaded it in, in the software and um, this is how I came up with this design. And I also like to uh, play animations uh, on my garments so we can see how the fabric drapes on the body and how it moves uh, with all the body movements. Um, so yeah, this was uh, the whole project. So I think there is another slide. I don't remember. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, this slide is about the finishing techniques um, because, uh, for example, on the on the on the neckline, I could have chosen to add a, a facing. But uh, I think facings, uh, neckline facings are wasteful. So I didn't want to go in that direction. So instead I have uh, had it inner bias strip uh, inside the neckline um, to make it very clean. And I really love that uh, finishing technique. Um, um, yeah, because I don't like to see so much overlock. So yeah, it was a uh, better, I thought. Um, and in the middle back, you can see that there is overlock, um, just like a tiny part. And I have also added a invisible zip uh, on the back as well. 
So this dress um, is, uh, so it has been designed for a DIY. I haven't developed a full size wrench because um, I have had a lot of feedback um, about um, yeah, size inclusivity and style, size standardization as well. And um, it, it's not easy for people to download standard sizes and then to make uh, their own garments. Um, like zero waste garments. So I thought instead maybe I'm gonna provide some templates that people could um, modify and adapt to their own morphology. So um, I have tried. <laughs> so it's available on the, my website um, if you want to have a look more in details. I have also added some um, sewing, like simple sewing instruction as well. Um, yeah. So that's it, if you have any questions. Nope. What kind of feedback did you get regarding, um, is it more feminine? You know, is this neat? The... Yeah, that's the funniest comment that you get. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had more like uh, positive feedbacks in terms of style because also because the print was uh, like very uh, flashy and uh, so people really liked it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was quite more positive. Um, but, you know, in this in this um, research for more feminine, I was not very comfortable because uh, um, yeah, this is not my style. So it's kind of difficult to design sometimes a uh, garment that um, you wouldn't wear. Um, at the end, this is why I have decided to make a wider body uh, shape uh, because at least um, the, the breast is not uh, too much fitted. Um, so that was the, the, the kind of balance that I, I, I finally uh, yeah, decided to go for. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I can totally understand the starting point or like the the need to prove people wrong, especially <laughs> um, since my experiences are not about or like my experiences about uh, zero waste regarding other people people's opinion is that it's very experimental and in that way it's very feminine. So it's it's funny to hear that some people would consider it still the forms even in, in their experimental state be like very masculine mm. but of course it depends on the viewers experience and understanding of what the garment is but I love the dress it's amazing <laughs> thank you yeah I think the, the um the main critic was uh, like people uh, like garments are too architectural and uh for example, if you think about uh, cos lines or shapes, uh, this is a the kind of brand that uh, inherently they, they, it's could be easier to make a zero waste design, like uh, to have squared shapes. Um, but yeah, I've, obviously we have seen in those different examples mm -hmm. that uh, we can do differently. Mm. Yeah, it's so great. The, the, the more this uh, field matures and you see more and more variation um examples and things and that's it's so great uh, to yeah. see just how much difference mm. there is yeah okay so we're um do we have any any other just I don't know, questions or comments or Thank you so much, everyone, for presenting. This is really awesome, and I love being able to see everyone's work. It's so great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for giving me this opportunity because I've seen like everybody are like awesome, and they're. I mean, I'm. I'm. I understood that I'm still in the starting of the zero waste, and you're all like experts. <laughs> Thank you. So we're gonna. Um, we're gonna post this afterwards but uh yeah we plan to host other community call sessions so if you have any suggestion for the the upcoming um uh, calls you feel free to send us 
Um, but I think this Boma is quite, uh, could be nice to have frequently. Yeah, super cool. Awesome. Hey, Thank it's, you everyone. Oh, sorry. Oh, interesting. sorry. Uh, it's Julia talking. I have at least two friendly souls in here with the plant uh, or natural dyeing. I just want to show what I'm stitching right now as we're um, talking. I'm doing, a, it's not zero waste related, but it's sustainable because I'm taking all the um, curtain fabrics and I'm uh, dyeing them with uh, tea and rust. Oh, wow. Nice. Beautiful colors. Yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. So it's a bit dark. It's not, it's in Sweden, it's, <laughs> it's quite light and dark. <laughs> now, but uh, yeah, like that. Nice, so cool. Is it just fabric at the moment? No, curtains? It, yeah, I just take something, either linen or cotton, and then I score it properly. And then I use alum, actually, for the fixing. And um, I, I'm reusing it in, I have um, another kind of side of my uh, passion is the tea. In the tea community, we're using those for the tea tables to use it as, a, you know, to serve tea on them. And uh, for one year, they're out and they are not bleaching out. They're actually quite strong in color. They are not exposed to the sun like 24 seven, but then even if it's artificial dyeing, it also can bleach out if you put it in the direct sunlight. So it's just like this, uh, but it's interesting learning. Soon I'm gonna start making zero waste dresses in the natural dyeing. So I'm coming, watch the space. <laughs> but thank you everyone. It's really uh, inspiring and um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was thank nice you. seeing you all. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you.